The next reaction that we're going to discuss is called the oxymercuration demercuration reaction. And so it happens in two steps. The first step is called the oxymercuration part, and the second step is called the demercuration part. The end product of this reaction is forming an alcohol. And it does follow Markovnikov's rule in that the alcohol will end up on the more substituted side. And so we already did see one reaction, you might recall, where we were able to start with an alkene and we were to get an alcohol product on the more substituted side. And that was an acid catalyzed hydration. So water was the reactant and we used some strong acid, which is just denoted as H plus or H3O plus, in order to facilitate uh, the reaction speed to speed it up as a catalyst, and we formed an alcohol. Now, both of these could technically give you the same product, whether you do acid catalyzed hydration or oxymercuration demercuration. But sometimes reactions will undergo rearrangements, and we're not going to really get into rearrangements very much in this class, but particularly doing acid catalyzed hydration leads to methyl rearrangements, hydride rearrangements, and so. You don't always get the product that you think you would get with uh, that method. Whereas using the oxymercuration, oxymercuration, demercuration method, this does not undergo those pesky rearrangements. So it's a good way to get the actual product that you think you're going to get. But don't really worry, worry too much about those rearrangements. We're not going to spend uh, time on them in this class. So the first step of this reaction uses mercury to acetate and then a nucleophile being water so it still is a hydration reaction just a different type of hydration reaction now the mercury to acetate that HgOac2 that might look a little funky it's also sometimes called mercuric acetate and what it is is there's two acetate groups so that's abbreviated as OAC so we have AC and then an O bonded to a mercury ion. So you might recall acetate is C2H3O2 minus. And so that abbreviation is used for AC right there. That's the acetate ion. In water, what will happen is this mercuric acetate will dissociate and one of the acetates will break off. And so what we get is an ion where the hydrogen has a positive charge. This is called the mercuric ion. And this acts as an electrophile in the reaction. That mercuric ion will be what gets attacked by our pi electrons of our alkene in the first step of the reaction. So the overall equation is written at the top and you can see the end result of step one and then step two at the bottom. So after we do step one with mercury two acetate and water, we end up with an OH group on the more substituted side and we end up with this organometallic mercury acetate bonded to the least substituted side. And so we're almost there uh, when we're heading towards our hydration product, the alcohol is already in place. The second step then uses something called sodium borohydride in order to reduce the um, organometallic mercury acetate and replace it with a hydrogen. We're not going to go to uh, in depth in the steps because that is a radical reaction and it's rather involved. So notice that the hydrogen is kind of highlighted there. It's in blue of the sodium borohydride. Well, that is a source of hydride, which hydride is H minus, it's an ion. And so what ends up happening is that organometallic mercury acetate ends up getting replaced with a hydrogen ion on the least substituted side of the double bond. And so that completes the final transformation, giving us our alcohol product or our hydrated product. Okay, so next we are going to go through the oxymercuration demercuration mechanism. So we'll start with step one, which is the mercury 2 acetate in water. And so the first step 
is using our pi electrons of our alkene that's going to function as a nucleophile to attack that mercury which can function as an electrophile. So mercury is a metal, it can have a positive charge, it is mercury too, but also the mercury has electrons on it and they're not written in this structure so I'm going to add them there. And those electrons can actually go back and interact with our partial charge that would be forming where a carbocation would form. So this should look really similar to what we saw in the bromonium ion mechanism. So first our pi electrons of our alkene attack the mercury, and then that lone pair of electrons that are associated with the mercury actually go back and attack the double bond. So we formed this bridge species, this uh, ring, which is very similar to the bromonium ion, only it's called a mercurinium ion intermediate. And after this happens, we see one of our acetates break off. So whether you start with the species that's drawn here as your electrophile, or you start with the species where the mercury had a positive charge, that mercuric cation, either one of those is totally acceptable because we're still just showing that first step right there. So we form the mercurinium ion intermediate which is right in between where that double bond was on our original alkene. And at this point, just like the bromonium ion was bulky, it was rather sterically hindered, it led to anti-attack, the same thing will happen when our nucleophile comes in um, attacking our mercurinium ion. It's bulky, it's big, water is going to be our nucleophile in this next step now. And that positive charge, remember, is shared amongst the mercury and the two carbons but the site of the most positive charge was the more substituted side. And so that's where that carbocation would have formed had it formed at all. So our nucleophile will come in and attack the more substituted side of the carbocation from the opposite side as the mercurinium ion because it's sterically hindered. So we're gonna use a lone pair of electrons on the water and they're going to attack that more substituted carbon. And just like the bromonium ion, when it does, that mercurinium ion, that bridged, that ring, is going to break open. So it'll break open from the same side as the attack. Those electrons in between that carbon that got attacked and the mercury swing over and go to the mercury. And then that breaks it open so it can swing open. And you have that organometallic mercury acetate attached to the least substituted carbon now. And so we added our nucleophile water to the more substituted side. Um, Oxygen is going to have a positive formal charge because it has three bonds and one lone pair. So we have to remove a proton. This is a deprotonation step. And what we can use is we can use acetate. So C2H3O2 minus. You, you might remember that that's basic. And so something that is a base would love to grab a proton. So the negative charge on the acetate will grab a proton those electrons will stay with the oxygen, and essentially we neutralized that formal charge. We got rid of that. That's a proton transfer from one species to another. And so a side product you just formed there, you had acetate grab a proton, is acetic acid, so HC2H3O2. It's not important in our mechanism going forward, but it is a side product that is formed, which is just not the major one that we're interested in. So that would end step one. Step one is the mercury two acetate with the nucleophile water, and it stops right here where we have an alcohol on the more substituted side, and we have that organometallic mercury acetate on the least substituted side. So now we would proceed to the demercuration step. So step two uses a reagent called sodium borohydride, and sodium borohydride, we said on the previous slide, is a source of hydride. Hydride is an ion. It's H minus. We're used to writing H plus where hydrogen is a proton, but it can form a negative charge as well when it picks up an extra electron. Now, we're not going to go through the steps of all of this because this is a radical process. And so it's rather involved. But what you need to know is that the net result is that that organometallic Mercury acetate gets exchanged out for a hydrogen where it was. And so this is a reduction step. 
So sometimes this reaction, um, they call it oxymercuration reduction. Uh, it means the same thing, essentially. It's the same reaction, just with a different name. And our final product of interest is the one right over here at the end, where we have an alcohol, and that alcohol went on the most substituted side. And so this is a Markovny cup addition where we ended up with it on the more substituted side. Most of the reactions that we're learning in this uh, alkene chapter are Markovnikov additions. We'll see a couple that are called anti-Markovnikov where they end up putting the group on the least substituted side, but those are uh, more rare. Now, this same reaction can be modified just slightly and be called the alkoxymercuration demercuration reaction. So instead of it being oxy, it's now alkoxy. So what we add is an uh, alkoxy group across the double bond. Instead, we get an ether rather than getting an alcohol. So notice what's changed. In step one, we're still using our mercury to acetate, but our nucleophile is now an alcohol. So this is something we saw when we were uh, looking at changing the nucleophile when we were doing a uh, halogenation reaction, specifically the bromination. We added water and we got an alcohol, and then we changed our nucleophile to an alcohol and we got an ether. The same thing is true with our mercuration reaction. So if we change the nucleophile to be some alcohol, for example, it could be methanol, ethanol, so ETOH, propanol, PROH, those are just the abbreviations. It would not just say ROH, R just means any alkyl group. So you wanna not include R on your actual final products. The second step is the same as well. We use NABH4, which is sodium borohydride. And that is acting as a reducing agent, which remember exchanges out the organometallic mercury for a hydrogen. Notice also um, when looking at a ring structure for our equation, we can see how the anti-addition plays out a little better, how the groups are added to opposite sides or opposite faces of the ring. So our ether, which is being represented by OR, is pointed up in this example, it's on a wedge, and our hydrogen is pointed down, it's on a dash. And so that would be true with the oxymercuration demercuration reaction as well because it went through that anti attack known as anti addition. And so we're going to run through this mechanism quick, but it's going to be basically identical to the oxymercuration demercuration reaction that we just saw, but it's good for practice. Okay, so talking through this again, we start with our alkene, that is our nucleophile. The electrons of the alkene attack the mercury ion. And then what happens is immediately some of the electrons that are associated with the mercury go back and form our bridge or our ring, which gives us our mercurinium ion. One of the acetates dissociates off or breaks off. Or remember, you can start with Hg plus OAC if you're assuming that one of the acetates essentially dissociated before the reaction started. Either way, you would still have the two arrows forming the mercurinium ion for sure. So then in our next step, we're going to use an alcohol, which is our ROH, to act as our nucleophile and attack the location of the most uh, positive charge, which is going to be our most substituted side. So that's going to be right here. We start with a lone pair of electrons on the oxygen, and it attacks opposite the face of the mercurinium ion. And then the mercurinium ion breaks open, and the electrons in the covalent bond between carbon and mercury go back to the mercury. Now we have kind of a protonated ether on our uh, more substituted side. We have to do a proton transfer step where we essentially use our acetate ion that was booted off from the first step to grab and pluck that proton. So we take the negative charge on our acetate we remove that proton and those electrons go back to the oxygen. Notice your oxygen has a plus one formal charge at this point. And your organometallic mercury acetate is bonded to the least substituted side. So now we are essentially done with our alkoxy mercuration, our step one. 
So we have an ether that is on our more substituted side. We have our organometallic on the least substituted side. We essentially need to use in step two, our sodium borohydride, which is our reducing agent, to remove through a radical reaction that mercury acetate and swap it out with a hydrogen. So if you want to draw this in, if this helps you, you it's not exactly how it happens, but it is something you could do. You can start with H minus, and you can take the negative charge on the hydrogen and attack the carbon where the mercury acetate is bonded to, and then break off the mercury acetate. So we replaced that with a hydrogen there. And that gives us our ether product, where we have OR right here. And it's on the most substituted side, just like the last reaction. And that's because it went uh, through that mercurinium ion intermediate. So it gave us the Markovnikov addition. We had anti-attack as well due to that mercurinium ion being large and bulky and our alcohol nucleophile attacking from the opposite face. So this one is face up, this one is face down in the final product, which is a lot easier to see when using wedges and dashes and drawing a ring structure. Next, we're going to look at a hydration method. So once again, we are going to be forming an alcohol, but we are going to look at an anti-Markovnikov addition across our double bond. So Markovnikov additions meant that the group, the uh, group was added to the more substituted side, whereas an anti-Markovnikov addition places the OH group on the least substituted side. So if we look at our initial alkene, right here we have our least substituted side, here we have our most substituted side. So in our product, you can see that the alcohol group was placed on the least substituted side. So this reaction is called the hydroboration oxidation reaction, and it also occurs in two separate steps. The first step uses BH3THF, which is called borane tetrahydrofuran. And we'll look at that a little bit more in depth in a second before we do the mechanism. And in the second step, we use sodium hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide. So the second step is the actual oxidation step of the name, and the first step is the hydroboration step. We also see with this reaction, thin addition. So thin is the opposite of anti-addition. Anti-addition, the groups were added to opposite faces. In thin addition, they're added to the same side or the same face. So notice with our cyclohexane ring, the hydroxyl group, which is on the least substituted side, is on a uh, wedge, and so that means it's face up on the ring. And the other group that was added to the other side is a hydrogen, and that's also on a wedge. So that is also face up. So these two are on the same side. That is a consequence of the mechanism that this reaction proceeds through. And so it occurs in two steps. Um, the first step using uh, borane tetrahydrofuran is the hydroboration step. And if you start with your alkene, notice that you end up with a BH2 group uh, on the least substituted side there. And that actually will change a little bit from this equation that's written. But regardless, at the end, your alkyl borane gets oxidized in the oxidation step using hydrogen peroxide in basic conditions, so with something like sodium hydroxide. And it takes that alkyl borane and it converts it to an alcohol. So the end result is that we have an alcohol placed on the least substituted side of the alkene. The other group that's added that we're not seeing is there is a hydrogen that's added as well, but they are both on the same side that they're added. BH3 is called borane, and it is a molecule that is used in the hydroboration oxidation reaction. So we want to kind of look at it a little more in depth before we dive into the mechanism. The reason that this reaction ends up being an anti-Markovnikov addition is due to boron. So boron is just the element B. So boron, if we look at the electronegativity, it's 2.0. It's actually lower than hydrogen. Hydrogen is 2.2. So boron has a higher electronegativity than hydrogen. 
So when we start looking at the partial charges that are formed in this uh, molecule, all the outer hydrogens actually have the partial negative charge. And that's uh, not what we're familiar with. Normally the central atom was more electronegative and the outer atoms were more electropositive, but it's flipped on our borane molecule. So the boron actually is partially positive in the center. And so when we see our nucleophilic attack from our alkene, what ends up happening is the more electronegative atom still does end up on the uh, more substituted carbon, which is what happened in all the other reactions. It's just that the more electronegative atom is hydrogen this time. And so the least electronegative atom is the boron, and that ends up on the least substituted side. So here is our least substituted side. This carbon would be our more substituted side. So corresponding to here and then corresponding to here. Um, I'm just using that this has one R group on this side to say that the red dot is our more substituted side because it has an alkyl group, whereas the other side just has two hydrogens coming off. So it really does follow um, nucleophilic and electrophilic attacks and where things should go properly, but it just seems opposite due to the boron being less electronegative than the, than the hydrogen, so it's ending up on the other side, which is what drives it to be anti-Markovny cub in the first place. So the borane molecule that's used in this reaction is highly reactive, and that's due to the fact that it does not have a complete octet of electrons around it. So the borane actually acts a lot like a carbocation. So your boron would lie in a plane with the three hydrogen atoms. So we can show one coming forward, we could show one going back, and then the third one would be lying directly in the plane of the paper like this, but they're all flat. They're trigonal planar to one another. And so on boron, there is actually an empty p orbital lying above and below that plane right here. And so that makes it uh, very susceptible to attack. Um, and what we do to stabilize it is we use another molecule called tetrahydrofuran. Um, borane is also a highly toxic gas, so we can't just use it on its own. But the borane part of this reaction is what's actually taking part in the reaction itself. It's not the tetrahydrofuran. The tetrahydrofuran is just used to stabilize the borane. Um, borane will even react with itself if it's pure. So it'll form a dimer, B2H6, called diborane, it can also, if we were to use it pure, form explosive mixtures uh, by reacting with the air. It can also ignite spontaneously. So basically, we want to keep it free of air, free of moisture, and we use the tetrahydrofuran to stabilize it. And how it stabilizes it is it forms a Lewis acid base complex, and we already previously learned about those. So the Tetrahydrofuran part of this guy is a five-membered ring, which has a heteroatom. A heteroatom is anything other than carbon, so it contains oxygen within the ring. And the lone pair of electrons on the oxygen essentially act as a Lewis base and attack the boron, which acts as a Lewis acid. And it forms this complex that you see right here. So the boron ends up with a partial negative charge. The oxygen ends up with a partial positive charge. Notice there's still a lone pair of electrons on the oxygen there, one left that's free. And so this bond right here, it would be essentially the adduct, the adding of those two together. So all that tetrahydrofuran for is for is to stabilize the borane molecule so we can actually use the borane in our reaction. And how this complex is abbreviated, as you see above, is written as BH3 and then dot dot THF. So that just represents the whole boring tetrahydrofuran complex. Next we are going to go through the mechanism for the hydroboration oxidation reaction. So we're going to start out with our alkene functioning as a nucleophile and what will happen is the pi electrons of the alkene will attack the empty p orbital of boron in borane.
We don't have to draw the THF or anything because that's not actually involved in the reaction. So we just start off with our BH3 next to our alkene. And so the pi electrons will attack the boron. And in that moment, the boron will start developing a partial negative charge because it's like it has four bonds to it, just as it did in the BH3 THF complex. And then if we imagine that that was the last step, there would be a partial positive charge or a carbocation that would be developing on the more substituted side of the alkene because that would be the more stable positive charge. We don't actually get a full positive charge that develops because immediately what happens is a hydride shifts shift occurs and it takes the hydrogen and it bonds it to where that partial positive charge will be forming. So we end up with a four-membered transition state. These two initial arrows that occur in the beginning, the alkene attacking the boron on the least substituted side and hydrogen forming a bond to carbon on the most substituted side is said to be a concerted reaction or a concerted step. So think about it like it's in concert and when you have a concert going on, like an orchestra, everything happens at once. And so that's what a concerted reaction is. All those steps are occurring at the same time together. And so this reaction goes through a transition state rather than a reactive intermediate. A transition state is a high energy point along the potential energy diagram. So if we just draw a generic potential energy diagram, at the top of the hill is where our transition state lived. So this is a high energy intermediate. It's not going to be uh, living very long. You can't isolate this transition state. So the dashed lines represent partially broken and partially formed bonds. So we'll just say partial bonds. And that symbol, the double crosshair, means transition state and we also usually put brackets around the transition state as well and so notice that the hydrogen and the boron from the borane are on the same side of the double bond and so this is where that syn addition comes into play so they're not on opposite sides and the boron is bonded to the least substituted side and the hydrogen is on the more substituted side. So here's our more substituted side. Here's our least substituted side. And that has to do with sterics. By having the boron on the least substituted side, it's less crowded. And so it, it essentially will lower the energy by having less steric hindrance being on that less substituted side. And initially, our nucleophilic alkene attacked our boron because remember boron is partially positive in BH3 whereas the hydrogens are partially negative. So we had a hydride shift, our partially negative hydrogen went back and attacked that carbocation that would be forming and the nucleophilic alkene attacked the electrophilic boron center. And that all happened at once and we formed this transition state where the hydrogen and the boron are essentially going to be bonded to the same side. So after it goes through that high energy transition state, the energy is lowered and at the end of our hydroboration step, we now have our hydrogen and we're left with BH2. So the hydrogen is bonded to the most substituted side and the BH2 group is bonded to the least substituted side. So one at a time, each one of the hydrogens that is bonded to the boron is going to get replaced for the alkyl group surrounding it. So this is a continuation of the hydroboration step until we get a trialkoxy borane. So meaning we have three of the R groups surrounding the boron. So we can think about this whole R group from our alkene that we started with is just having one alky alkyl group. So one at a time, we're going to replace the other two hydrogens that are attached to the boron with that exact same alkyl group. Basically, that first step that we saw, that concerted reaction, would be repeated with another alkene for each available hydrogen that there is on this molecule right here until we replace the other two hydrogens one at a time with the exact same alkene group. 
which becomes an Elko group on there. So you don't have to show all the arrows over and over again, but we do show the replacement of those hydrogens. So notice here, we now have two of our same alkyl group, the first one, and then one of the other hydrogens was replaced. So what we're left with is one hydrogen bonded to the, the boron. This is the abbreviation of the shorthand notation at the bottom here. We use a parenthesis and then write two on the outside to indicate that there's two of those alkyl groups bonded to the boron. And then lastly, that remaining hydrogen will get replaced. This reaction will go through this concerted step again, react with the alkene, replace that last hydrogen, and now you have three of the same alkyl groups surrounding your boron. And so using the shorthand notation, you have a parenthesis and you put a three on the outside. So see your boron has no hydrogens left surrounding it anymore. It has been replaced one at a time until you have the trialkyl borane. So this would be the final end of the hydroboration step when you have replaced all of those hydrogens with the alkyl group of the alkene that you're reacting it with. So lastly is the oxidation step. And the oxidation step of this reaction actually goes through a lot of steps. It is the hydrogen peroxide that is the key oxidator here. It's just taking place in basic conditions. All you need to really know is the outcome of the oxidation step, which is that the boron gets replaced with a hydroxyl group to give us an alcohol product. We don't usually cover the mechanism for the oxidation part of this reaction in um, an intra organic chemistry class like this. You might see it if you were to take a higher level organic chemistry course. But notice that you had in your trialkyl borane, you had three alkyl groups attached to that boron. So each one of those could be replaced to actually give you three moles of our new alcohol product at the end. And also notice where the alcohol is at in comparison to the original alkene. This is an anti-Markovnikov mechanism. That's what this AM represents. And that means that our alcohol functional group ends up being on the least substituted side. So that's where it got added to. The hydrogen ended up on the most substituted side. And that is because of the electronegativity of boron and how the reaction essentially progressed due to that. They also are both being shown on the same face. And that's because it went through that syn addition and that transition state where they were both added to the same side of the double bond.